We are heading into week eight, and believe it or not, there are still guys that you need to be checking your waiver wire for before we head into next week. Alfredo Brown is on assignment today, but I am joined by the wonderful Joey Wright, and we are going to talk about all the waiver wire pickups and drops that you should be looking at as we head into week eight. Joey, go ahead and start us off. Let's talk about running backs. Who is a running back that you should be looking at on the waiver wire? Ooh, Gus Edwards, 144 total yards yesterday and a touchdown in that win over the Lions. Um, he got 72% of the running back Ooh. touches yesterday. Two weeks in a row now, he's out-snapped Justice Hill. And even without that 80-yard reception, his fantasy day was still really good. Um, he is now, for me, the preferred back in Baltimore. Um, faces the Cardinals next week, who allow 29.8 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs, which includes over 92 total yards to the RB1 in six straight games. Wow. Go add Gus Edwards if he's out there. Love that one and kind of make the joke. Snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, snap. We've been talking about different Baltimore running backs seemingly every single mm -hmm. week, but Gus Edwards has carved out a role, and he's kind of been the guy for, what, four or five years now when they need somebody to lean on. Had big hopes for J.K. Dobbins, but with him out, Gus Edwards definitely seems to be the guy. If you're watching the show on YouTube right now, do us a favor, give us a thumbs up. That's going to help some other people find the video and drop any questions you have in the comments below. We will be sure to answer all of those. I'm going to talk about two guys that I talked about last week and the week before. Roshan Johnson and Deonta Foreman still each available in over 50% of leagues. Khalil Herbert, I'm sure you heard, was hit, uh, placed on IR with a high ankle sprain. Means he's not going to be back until at least week 11. And Donta Foreman looked great last week. And not just the eye test either. You look at the numbers, rushing yards over expectation per attempt. He was second in the league yesterday, or, well, this week, I should say. And he was in a split with Darrington Evans. And I think that kind of surprised some people, especially after he saw such a workhorse role in week six. But even with the split touches, Deonta Foreman was still good enough to be very fantasy relevant as he rumbled for the RB1 finish so far Monday night pending. I'd anticipate a pretty similar deployment when Roshan Johnson returns, kind of a split between the two backs. The good news is Foreman and Roshan Johnson are both talented enough that they can be fantasy relevant. So go ahead and pick both of these guys up if you can. We're looking at two guys that could be spot starts until Khalil Herbert returns. Joey, throwing this over to you. This guy, potential future Hall of Famer, you know, drafted as an RB1 year after year, and now he's somebody that you might be looking at on the waiver wire. Yeah, we're looking at Ezekiel Elliott, former Dallas Cowboys running back, now with the New England Patriots. Um, listen, while the red zone carries are split almost, but favor, like they do favor, sorry, Ramondre Stevenson at like a 55 to 45, so they're just favoring him. Yesterday, Zeke had 100% of the Patriots' touches from inside the 10 yard line. It appears like Zeke is this goal line back that a lot of us thought that he might become. It just took a little while to get there. Um, and it's been trending this way the last three weeks. So it's not something that just happened yesterday. The trend is happening yesterday. Just the full shift over to him. Um, if yesterday's game against a good Bills defense encouraged you rest of the season, um, for what the Patriots might be able to do if they get into the red zone, which they haven't a lot this year. And that's one of the big issues. Zeke's going to be the goal line back. So I think he's worth rostering in leagues. And hopefully, if, you know, if yesterday was a new step for them, uh, this will be a definitely a valuable piece to have on your team. Yeah, and, you know, Zeke has a little bit of standalone value with this goal line role, but also he's looking like somebody who can still shoulder the load. You know, we thought that he was just completely washed up at this point, but maybe he's not quite washed up. And if something happens to Ramadre Stevenson, then we're looking at a potential high-end RB2 in this offense. Now I'm going to talk about Tajay Spears, another guy that we've talked about a lot on this show, so I'm not going to bore you with it too much. But uh, he is outperforming Derrick Henry in almost every single efficiency metric this year. You look at rushing yards over expectation, broken tackle rate, breakaway run rate, juke rate, pretty much every rate metric. And obviously, Derrick Henry is still getting the bulk of the touches here. But Tajay Spears, especially in PPR formats, could have some standalone value as kind of a low-end RB2 here. He has very much so been the lightning to Derrick Henry's thunder. And with Tennessee coming off of a bye, you know, there were a lot of bye weeks last week. He could have been dropped in some leagues. So he's one of those guys that, you know, probably shouldn't be available, but showing that he still is available in almost two and three leagues. So check your waiver wire, see if Tajay Spears is available, pick him up and, uh, you know, has a little bit of standalone value, but really like we talked about with Ezekiel Elliott, you're looking at that contingent upside. If Henry has to miss any time, Tajay Spears is suddenly looking like a low-end RB1. 
Joey, talk to us about another guy coming off of a buy that might be available in some leagues. Yeah, Devin Singletary coming off a buy as well. In week six, Devin Singletary mashed the presumed lead back and heartthrob of the Houston Texans, Damian Pierce, uh, in total touches. Uh, so they were right and neck with each other. And Singletary actually had more yards than Pierce, which hurt my heart. Um, but this followed a week five performance that saw Singletary receive just a target and no carries. Um, what does that mean for this Houston offense? I, I do think they're both going to be involved. I think Pierce is probably still the lead back in this offense, but Singletary is going to be there getting touches every week. Um, if something happens to Pierce, we've seen from Singletary's time in Buffalo, he can shoulder a workload. Uh, I am very happy having Singletary on my bench. I'm not starting him yet, but definitely worth rostering. Yeah, we had high hopes for him in the preseason. Didn't really see it through the first few weeks, but it looks like a, he is carving out a role for himself. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to talk about last week, like everybody's waiver wire darling, suddenly back on the menu, Amari De Mercado, after doing almost nothing in week six when people were splashing 40, 50, 60% of their fab on him. Now all of a sudden he looks like the clear workhorse. He saw a 94.7% opportunity share in yesterday's game. And we talked about possibly cutting him when we were talking about our drops last week. And I was a little wary of cutting De Mercado because I, I said only in very shallow non PPR leagues should you think about cutting him because he led the team in routes run and those touches or I'm sorry, those routes run turned into touches last week as we saw and turned into production in a game where they were trailing. So he might be a little bit game script dependent as we saw, you know, they were behind for the majority of yesterday's game, but they had to keep throwing the ball to him. He looked like a workhorse in this role. Keontae Ingram and Damian Williams combined for one touch. So we're still looking at James Conner on IR. He's going to miss at least the next three weeks, maybe even more than that. Amari De Mercado, not the sexiest name, but I think somebody that you can stream for the next few weeks if you are in running back trouble. Now, this guy that we're going to talk about next, Joey, I think is probably going to be the number one waiver wire pickup for anybody this week who didn't get him before Sunday's game. Talk to us about Daryl Henderson. Yeah, I mean, with Kyron Williams going on the IR for the next four weeks, the Rams are going to be without uh, Kyron. So they had to go out and they had to do it fast. They had to figure out what they're going to do. So they activated Royce Freeman off the practice squad. Uh, they rolled out Zach Evans as a rookie. See, so maybe he'll start. And then they're like, you know what? Let's go get that guy that was here last year. Let's go get Daryl Henderson back. And then the Friday press conference came around and Sean McVay was just praising Daryl Henderson. And I noticed a lot of people after that press conference, like my sleeper notifications were going off. Everyone was adding them um, in the leagues. And when Sunday came around, it proved true. Zach Evans did not see a touch, uh, which was kind of surprising with the rookie. You thought they'd give him a little bit of work, not a single touch in the game. And Daryl Henderson out. Not even Royce an Freeman. offensive snap. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, Joey, yeah, but he yeah. didn't even see the field the yesterday. Field. So, yeah. Well, I mean, what does that tell you about Evans' uh, value long-term? Probably nothing at all, which if you have him, you can definitely drop him. Um, Daryl Henderson outcarried Royce Freeman 18-12 to 12 and got the Rams' lone rushing touchdown. Uh, finished with 13.6 fantasy points. If you're going to roster a Rams running back for the next four weeks, until Kyron Williams gets back, it's Daryl Henderson. And I wouldn't be shocked if Henderson keeps an even bigger role, even when Kyron does come back. I do think Royce Freeman's still going to be involved a little bit week to week, but this is Henderson's backfield for the next few weeks. Completely agree. And you know, you talk about the 18 to 12 carry split between the two of them. We got to remember this is the first time Daryl Henderson has played a football game in almost a year. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even in training camp. He wasn't on a practice squad. I mean, he, like Justin Pugh, came straight off the couch and still was able to <laughs> shoulder the word workload here. So I think we see that grow a little bit. Uh, Daryl Henderson, we saw from weeks one through 12 in the 2021 season when Cam Akers was coming back from that Achilles tear, was putting up consistent high end RB2, low end RB1 production. He seems like he has hasn't really missed a beat as I think we see that conditioning build a little bit. We're going to see him in what presumes to be close to a workhorse role in Los Angeles. So yeah, my number one waiver wire pickup and, uh, you know, probably doesn't have a ton of appeal for the rest of the season, but for the next three weeks while Kyron Williams is out easily plugging him in as a top 15, top 20 running back. Now we're getting into the deep leagues here. Keaton Mitchell is still available in 97% of leagues and really, really deep leagues, kind of a speculative ad here. We talked about Gus Edwards kind of being the guy but Keaton Mitchell was a guy that drew a lot of buzz in the preseason. You know, he is a spark plug, ran a 4 3 7 40 yard dash, looked really good in the touches he had in the preseason, and then hit IR. 
Well, he's back now. Saw his first touch of the regular season last week and looked pretty good. I mean, it was just one catch that he took for nine yards, but showed the speed, showed the elusiveness, broke a tackle, picked up the first down. Edwards and Justice Hill seem to be the guys for now, but uh, Mitchell could carve out a larger role as the season progresses. So kind of plug him in your deep leagues, still available at 97% of leagues. So I'm not saying that you need to make this guy a priority add, but worth a speculative pickup and stash for now. Joey, we've got a couple more running backs we want to talk about. Talk to us about a really old name that we probably didn't expect to be talking about in 2023, but here we are. And it's Cordell Patterson. Like, <laughs> welcome back, buddy. Um, you know, yesterday he had an uptick in, in carries from what we've seen from him at all this season uh, due to Bijan Robinson having a headache, which caused kind of a headache for everyone that started <laughs> Bijan Robinson yesterday. Um, prior to week seven, I mean, Patterson only saw one carry and two targets on the entire season. Uh, this two-headed monster of Robinson and Algier have kind of stripped him most, most of his value. In deep leagues, I'm fine rostering him. This is like a deep league guy. That you're going to want to grab in case that headache carries on a little longer. Um, week eight, they face the Titans, and that's a tough, tough run defense. So I'm not starting Patterson, but in deep leagues, you can put him on your bench and see what happens. Yeah, and I don't want to get overreactive to what happened with B. John Robinson yesterday. I mean, really burned a lot of fantasy managers, but I can't help but think about Percy Harvin. Joey, I know you've been playing fantasy football for a long time. How many yeah. times would Percy Harvin, you know, when he was on the field, he would crush and then he would have these migraines that would just flare up all the time and he'd miss games. So Cordell Patterson, definitely worth a stash because as we saw yesterday, if B. John Robinson can't play, there is going to be a role for Cordell Patterson. Now, wrapping up running backs, I'm going to talk about Pierre Strong. Uh, we're looking at a possible high ankle sprain for Jerome Ford, who exited the game, and Strong saw a decent amount of work. He saw five carries to Kareem Hunt's two carries after the Jerome Ford injury. So I think Hunt is probably going to be the lead guy here, but there could also be a split between the two, as we have seen the Kevin Stefanski-led Cleveland Browns offense do for so long. Strong also profiles as a very good pass catcher. He's got great hands. He's kind of small. He's got that quick twitch mentality he's really good in open space the Browns traded for him this offseason so they clearly like what they see in him mm -hmm. I think he could be a pretty sneaky pickup in PPR leagues as long as Ford is out which could be the next three to six weeks I think Kareem Hunt is obviously the biggest beneficiary of this Jerome Ford injury but Pierre Strong is somebody that is absolutely worth a pickup and he's available in almost every single league mm. right now Joey let's talk about some wide receivers here Start us off with a name that I am surprised to see is still available in almost 50% of leagues. Yeah, shout out to Jeff Bell yesterday, who on Football Guys Sunday Morning Live uh, said, start Jackson Smith and the Jigba this week. With the DK Metcalf news, even before the DK Metcalf news, Jeff Bell said he was comfortable starting them. So you should definitely give the kudos to Jeff Bell and watch Football Guys Sunday Morning Live every Sunday. From 11 to 12, where I'll be hosting. Uh, <laughs> Jason hauled in four of his seven targets for 63 yards and a touchdown yesterday. And this wasn't just a single performance. Last week, he followed it up. Uh, he had uh, four receptions for 48 yards. So he's putting together a good season now. Seattle starting to ease him into the offense. And even when DK Metcalf returns, I think he does have a role here now. Uh, he's kind of moved into that wide receiver flex conversation. If he's on your waiver wire, I'll be surprised. He shouldn't be. You need to add him immediately. Pause yeah, the show. And Go at him and then come back. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we yeah. talked about uh, first round rookies are a pretty safe investment in fantasy football. And sometimes it takes some time for them to warm up. And a lot of times we see that switch happen after the buy. And after the buy, Jackson Smith and Jigbo was suddenly on the field a lot more, seeing more targets. He could absolutely be that late season hammer that really helps out a lot of fantasy managers. I'm going to talk about a guy that we have talked about for three straight weeks here now. He was my start of the week last week and looked fantastic. Rashi Rice is still available in 53% of leagues. This was the third straight week where he was second in targets on the team behind only Travis Kelsey. He is a phenomenal athlete. What he can do after the catch, he moves like a running back in open space. We saw him truck through a defender yesterday. We saw him on the bubble screen two weeks ago where he looked like he was shot out of a cannon. The team draws up schemes or draws up plays to get him scheme touches, whether it's on screens or whether it is just getting him open in the end zone like we saw yesterday. He looks like the clear cut wide receiver one on this team. We got to remember he's a round two rookie that a lot of people kind of labeled a little bit raw so this slow ramp up is understandable but he is drawing targets when he's on the field he's seeing his role grow as he is on the field more often could absolutely be 
I don't want to throw around the term league winner here, but if he does solidify this role as a full-time player on the wider, as the wide receiver one on the Kansas City Chiefs, he could help you win some fantasy leagues. So Rashi Rice, still available in 53% of leagues, shouldn't be available in any leagues after this week. Joey, we got to, you know, running backs might be a little bit thin this week, but there are some really good this, wide receivers yeah. out there. Talk to us about Josh Downs a little bit, oh. who was Alfredo's start of the week. And, you know, kudos to Alfredo for that call. Yeah, I think all the football guys started the week went really well. Jagger had uh, Jordan Love, who had a decent game. Then I had Romeo Dobbs. Like, we all did good this week. Let's kudos to Hey, I had, I had Deonta Foreman and Jameer Gibbs. Feeling Let's good go. about those. Christian Watson kept me from being a perfect 7-for-7 seven seven this week. Uh, I, uh, yeah, Christian Watson, pain in I my was... heart. Wide open so many times, and Jordan Love <laughs> just completely missing him deep downfield. I was very happy to see Gibbs out there yesterday, but one player I was really happy to see out there yesterday was Josh Towns. You know, Kyle mm -hmm. Puka Nakua and Zay Flowers are kind of getting all the rookie love this year, but Josh Downs is putting together quite a, a rookie season. Uh, he's second on the Colts and targets 33 receptions through seven games and over 400 yards receiving, which is more than Amari Cooper, Chris Godwin, Drake London, guys that we established that we know that we like. Josh Downs is out there, you know, getting more receiving yards than them. Um, he's now back-to-back -back games with a touchdown, and he's building a great rapport with both Anthony Richardson, who sadly is now out for the season, and more importantly, now Gardner Minshew. And that was my fear, is that Gardner Minshew was just going to kind of favor Michael Pittman. But right. yesterday when we were watching the game, he was looking at both of them. So that's really exciting to see. Um, Downs, for me, is probably my favorite receiver to add this week. He's a must-add, and he's firmly in that wide receiver three with wide receiver two upside um, conversation. Yeah, Absolutely especially in PPR leagues. I mean, he's somebody you should be adding in every league, but especially in PPR mm -hmm. leagues, you know, he gets a lot of short touches that really rack up those points in PPR formats. I'm going to talk about a guy that I, I got to be honest, I'm not thrilled about adding, but I think that it would be uh, irresponsible to not mention Jamison Williams. He saw six targets yesterday, did nothing with those targets. Didn't catch a single ball, zero points, but he saw six targets. Uh, like I said, not a huge fan. My bust meter is starting to beep a little bit with the drops and the character concerns and the suspensions and the fighting in practice and the injuries. There's a lot of reason for concern here, but you cannot deny his ability to get deep on defenses. We saw the big touchdown just two weeks ago and need to hope that he can keep kind of reeling those in. Um, like I said, I feel like it would be irresponsible not to mention Jamison Williams, who's still available in 67% of leagues, but I don't know if he's somebody that you can really plug in and immediately look at as a guy that you can count on in your fantasy lineup, but worth the stash if you've got an extra bench spot. Now, Joey, this guy that you're going to talk about, I think, is somebody you might be able to just pick up and plug right into your starting lineup. Yeah, it's Kendrick Bourne. I mean, if you're going to start a Patriots wide receiver, Kendrick Bourne's the best option. Uh, it's 51 targets on the season. It leads the team, but it not just doesn't lead the team. It's double any wide receiver that's there. And the Patriots that are known to be the, let's throw it to the tight end, uh, he's out getting, he's out targeting them five to three at that option of over Hunter Henry. Uh, so Kendrick Bourne is getting the targets. He's getting the work. If you're going to roster a receiving option for the Patriots, it's him. Um, in the last two games, 16 receptions, over 150 receiving yards. And the last two games, he's a fine flex play, especially next week against the Dolphins when they're going to have to be chasing. I don't want to say chasing points, but they're going to have to throw if they're going to keep yeah. up with the Dolphins. I, I, <laughs> I nice have a feeling. But also, any given Sunday, man, who would have thought that the Patriots would go out and yeah. beat the Buffalo Bills yesterday? So, yeah, we always try to predict these game scripts. And as we see, it is a tricky, tricky game to play. The last guy I'm going to talk about here for your really deep leagues out there, Nelson Aguilar, who Sigmund Bloom talked about as his start of the week, did find the end zone, had an otherwise pretty quiet day outside of that touchdown catch. But Flowers, Odell, and in this game, Zay, Flower, or Zay Flowers, Odell, and uh, Rashad Bateman all out-targeted him in this game. But Aguilar has looked pretty good. He's leading the team in yards per route run. And really what this comes down to is me just wanting to invest in this Todd Munkin offense. It seems like they are firing on all cylinders now after a slowish start to the season. Lamar Jackson is looking like an MVP-level quarterback out there right now. And, you know, Aguilar can find his way into the end zone on any given week. So, uh, again, talking about deep leagues here, still available in 99% of leagues. Nelson Aguilar is a guy that you can pick up. No bye weeks next week, but we're going to have more bye weeks coming up, and he might work as a legitimate streamer going forward. Now, Joey, we also got quarterbacks and tight ends to talk about. 
I know you're happy to talk about Baker Mayfield as a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. Talk to us a little bit. You know, it's still available in 72% of leagues out there. So uh, Baker Mayfield might be more than just a streamer. Yeah, I mean, I'm a Bucks fan, and I was at the beginning of the season, I was like, let's tank for Caleb. Let's make it happen. But Baker's <laughs> playing well, and so I can't deny it. 18.2 fantasy points uh, yesterday against the Falcons at home. Uh, third game of 2023 with 18 or more fantasy points and over 30 yards rushing in two out of the last mm -hmm. three. And what Baker's doing is something I didn't expect him to do. I thought he was just going to shovel the ball to Chris Godwin, and this would be the fall-off season for Mike Evans. But him and Mike Evans are kind of building something a little special. Maybe Mike Evans is just that special, and he's going to get his 10th 1,000-yard receiving season in a row. But Baker's going to be a big part of that. Um, this offense is running through Baker right now because the Buccaneers uh, – running game is just it feels non-existent to me it's it makes bad. me sad every day it's yeah. bad <laughs> he has it it's funny uh, baker has a career high in completion percentage uh too and the next three matchups are somewhat favorable highlighted by a week 10 matchup against tennessee at home and tennessee's given up mm -hmm. a good amount of points to fantasy quarterbacks and wide receivers let me tell you about the uh quarterbacks that are on by week 10 patrick mahomes jalen hurts matthew stafford and tua these are four quarterbacks started in many many leagues it might not be a bad move to go out there, grab Baker for the bye week. I know it's a little that's, early. No, that, that's good thinking, though. Yeah. Because there's going to be a lot of people bidding for streaming quarterbacks heading into week 10. So why get into a fab bidding war for mm -hmm. these guys when you can just pick them up for free now, stash them if you've got the space, and then you've got the priority ad as we head into week 10. Some Absolutely. good outside the box thinking there, Joey, right? I like Thank that. You. I'm going to talk about Kyler Murray, who should be back within the next few weeks. There were some rumors that he might have been able to play last week, which I said were pretty slim chances, and we obviously didn't see him on the field. But Kyler Murray has basically been a top-10 quarterback every single year he has played in the league. On a per-game basis, he was the QB7 last year. The year before, he was QB4. The year before that, he was QB3. And he's going to lose out on some of that rushing upside coming off of the ACL, but I think people think that all he does is rush the ball, but Kyler Murray is a great passer. Now with Marquise Brown, Rondale Moore, Michael Wilson, Zach Ertz, and Trey McBride, he's got some good weapons around him. So he might not be this high-end QB1, but I think that he is still, once he is on the field, going to be a top 10, top 12 quarterback. So pick him up now, because as soon as word gets out that he is off IR and activated and ready to play, people are going to be throwing a lot of money at him. So get ahead of the curve and pick him up now for cheap while you can. Joey, one more quarterback. Bring us home here. Yeah, it's Gardner Minshew. Let's, let's park the bus out out front of the stadium let's go um probably one of the most fun players to watch play just you yeah, don't know he just looks great Minshew mania uh, like 3.0 or 4.0 so at this point where are we <laughs> <laughs> yeah Anthony Richardson his season's over sadly um I was sad to see that go down as a Florida Gator fan I was high on him coming into the season um definitely a good future there with the Colts but not this year uh Minshew he's been more than serviceable in relief over 300 passing yards and back-to-back -back games now Four total touchdowns in yesterday's loss to the Cleveland Browns. He was all over the place yesterday. I feel yep. like every time I looked up to the TV, I was at a family sports bar. I saw that hair just flying around. Uh, <laughs> he's got good matchups against Carolina in week nine when Jared Goff, Russell Wilson, Brock Purdy, and Trevor Lawrence are on by. Not like the quarterbacks I mentioned before, but still quarterbacks that we're starting. Uh, he could be a good bye week replacement. Um, and from a super flex or two quarterback league perspective, he's absolutely a, a must start at this point. And he's going to have uh, more better uh, good weeks than he has bad weeks. Um, he's built a good relationship. We mentioned earlier when we were talking about Josh Downs with Michael Pittman, but mainly Josh Downs with a rookie. And that's really exciting to see. Definitely want to add Gardner Minshew if I need a quarterback. And Superflex, two quarterback or for a bye week. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And in points per bad touchdown dance leagues, <laughs> if you're in one of those, Gardner Minshew is the priority ad behind only Mike Gusecki this week. Now let's finish it off here talking about tight ends, and then we will get to the drops, players that you are just done with that you don't want on your teams anymore. Mm -hmm. Joey, talk to me about one of my favorite tight ends in the league. I have just, this guy has just been, uh, I've had a soft spot in my heart for him for year after year after year, and he is finally putting it together and looking really good in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, well, the yardage hasn't really exactly been there the last couple of weeks. Hey, the touchdowns have been back-to-back -back games of the touchdown. Um, and he's averaged five targets a game and all but one since Mike Williams left in week three. So he's getting looked at. He's getting those targets. Um, and he does seem like the preferred tight end option now over Donald Parham. I wondered if Gerald ever, I do think there was a little bit of news on him kind of coming to the season with a little bit of an injury. He does seem like he's up to form now. Um, and it's so strange seeing a number seven get targeted at tight end. It throws me off. 
every single time he gets the ball in his hands, I'm like, wait, oh yeah, that's Gerald Everett. Um, and he has as many red zone targets the last two weeks as Keenan Allen. So he's getting utilized in the red zone as well. So if you're streaming tight end first, God bless you. Second, uh, the Chargers' next three opponents are among the 10 worst against tight ends. So this could be a nice little Gerald Everett run. Go out and grab him if you're streaming tight end and don't yeah. have any fear of starting him. I mean, just a great athlete. You look across the board, his 40-yard dash, burst, agility, speed score, all that stuff is just consistently in the 90th percentile, and now he's on a very, very good offense. So love that pickup. I think he might, I don't want to say plug-and-play, but I think if he can keep this type of performance up, he's going to be looked at as kind of a plug-and-play low-end wide receiver one. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about another tight end here. Taysom Hill, still available in 94% of leagues out there. He has 13 targets over the last two weeks, and he's still getting those goofy Taysom Hill touches. You know, six carries, had a few dropbacks. He gets utilized a lot near the end zone, but he is becoming a much bigger part of this offense. Only Alvin Kamara, who has only played a few weeks, but, I mean, he has been a weapon, but only Alvin Kamara has more touches inside the red zone than Taysom Hill. Kind of a risky play, but you are looking at the high-end ceiling every single week that he plays. So, Taysom Hill, still available in 94% of leagues, worth a pickup, and worth a stream if you're looking for a weekly ceiling. Suddenly now a little bit more involved as a receiver. Uh, Joey, I've got you talking about a bunch of different Tampa Bay Buccaneers players today, yeah. but I really like this pickup as well, and he is still available in 98% of leagues. When I saw the show sheet, I was like, man, there's a lot of bucks in here. Do I really want to talk about this after <laughs> yesterday? But we just lost by a field goal, so what can I say? Um, listen, Kate Otten, he's kind of showing flashes of the beginnings of a good tight end career. Um, you know, I think we're still a little ways off, but uh, two games this season with six targets. Uh, both those games came against weak teams against the tight end. So I think Tampa Bay might be showing their hand of when they're going to use Kate Otten. He's had double-digit points in both of those games as well. Next week, they face the Bills. I do not recommend starting Kate Otten next week. But looking down the road to week 11 and 13, Otten, two very favorable matchups. And during those weeks 11 and 13, Kyle Pitts, Mark Andrews, TJ Hawkinson are on by. Kate Otten could be your tight end by week replacement. Go out and get him now uh, before you need to go get him in week 11 and 13. Now that we talked about all the guys that you need to pick up in your fantasy leagues, now time to snip, snip, cut bait with these guys. Joey, talk us to somebody who we've been talking about cuts for a few weeks now, and we've talked about this guy kind of, you know, in, in your shallower leagues, who should you be looking to cut? Yeah, Antonio Gibson. Uh, I think that was the first name when we were discussing, like, who should we drop? I, I think I'm just done. Uh, you know, yeah. coming into the season, it was like, how much is Brian Robinson going to pull away from him? Is he going to pull away from Brian Robinson? And now the conversation with Gibson is, is Chris Rodriguez Jr. now the backup Ooh. running back in Washington? And I think that's something we truly have to worry about. Rod um, Rodriguez has outcarried him 11 to 5 the last uh, two weeks. Um, and what's kind of strange about it is Gibson's career averages have never been higher. They really haven't. Yeah. Just the commanders are not using him. And if they're not using him and then such a small workload, he doesn't have any reason to be on my rosters at this point. Yeah. Tough to think because, you know, we liked Antonio Gibson in the offseason and thought that he had a high upside with that, you know, receiving abilities and all that fun stuff. But, yeah, I don't think that he has any place being on fantasy rosters at this point. I'm going to talk about another guy that I was pretty high on coming into the season, Kendra Miller, really exciting rookie. Um, you know, the stars just haven't really aligned. He picked up a preseason injury that made it kind of slow for the, the, the start to his career. He missed the first couple of weeks. When he did come back in, he wasn't 100%. And now with Kamara back and with Jamal Williams back, he has just been a complete afterthought in the offense. Over the last two weeks, he's got two carries for negative one rushing yards. Kamara's the workhorse. Jamal Williams is a change of pace back. Taysom Hill is still getting his work as a rusher. And Kendra Miller, at this point, is going to need multiple injuries ahead of him to see the field consistently. So no point stashing Kendra Miller anymore. Joey, talk to us about the next cut that you've got. Yeah, I am cutting him in a lot of leagues, too. It's Wando Robinson. I mean, was it last week? Eight receptions or 62 yards against the Bills? Everything looks so promising. And then he just had one catch for 22 yards yesterday. Um, I And I use this analogy very loosely. The Giants remind me a lot of the Chiefs last year. Just not as talented. Where We're not really sure where the ball is going to go. They have a tight end they do kind of like, and they want to try to get him the ball. Um, I just I don't see any reliability in Wando Robinson the rest of the season. Even Daniel Jones coming back, if he does come back in the next couple weeks, doesn't exude much confidence from me. Um, 
there are better I stats. I think that might actually be a downgrade at this point. Based on yeah, how good Terod sadly. Taylor has looked, yeah. Daniel Jones coming back might be a net negative for the offense. Yeah, I, th- I just think there are better uses of that roster spot that Wandale Robinson's taken up, sadly. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I'm going to talk about Darnell Mooney. Uh, don't have too much to say here. He hasn't eclipsed four targets since week one. Week one was that weird game where DJ Moore was kind of the afterthought. Darnell Mooney was the wide receiver one, and then everybody in Chicago went, oh, yeah, let's get the ball in DJ Moore's hands. And since then, he has been the third option behind DJ Moore and Cole Komet on a run-first team. Tyson Bajan looked pretty good, but he wasn't really looking Darnell Mooney's way all that much. Of course, in your super deep leagues, you're stashing Darnell Mooney. He's always got the big play upside, but in most fantasy leagues, there's no reason to roster Darnell Mooney at this point. Joey, give us a two-for-one here. Two guys you can cut at once. You, you did it to me once, and you do it to me again. <laughs> I have to talk about two Buccaneers here. Uh, Kashawn Vaughn, I'll talk about him first. Um, you know, the Buccaneers run game is not good. Uh, Rashad White is uh, the lead back there, but he's basically has fantasy relevance through check down work. That's it. He's not really rushing for a whole lot. Kashawn Vaughn hasn't had a game with over 16 rushing yards this season, and he's barely used it all in the passing game. Vaughn, 100% droppable. Now, if you have a deep roster, I am actually still going to hold on to Sean Tucker. Ooh, normal all right. 12, normal 12-team 12 leagues with six roster spots, cut him. Please do. I still think Sean Tucker is the best running back the Bucks have. But like Antonio Gibson, not really being utilized by the commanders, they're just not giving the ball to Sean Tucker. They're not letting him on the field, really. I think once Tucker gets on the field and they let him work a little bit, I think it's going to come through that he is the best running back the Bucs have. But until then, you can't start him. If you have an extra roster spot, you can keep him there. But like I said, in normal 12-team leagues with six roster spots, you can't keep him there. But deeper leagues, I, I'm personally still holding on to him. And maybe that's a bit of a homer pick, but... <laughs> No, completely like understandable. You gotta ha- you gotta have your guys. I mean, what yeah. fun would fantasy football be if you're not stashing your guys? Uh, I'm going to give you another two for one here. Royce Freeman and Zach Evans. Zach Evans is the super obvious cut, as we said. You know, didn't even log an offensive snap yesterday, so cut bait. He's done. Royce Freeman, though, um, still saw a little bit of work, you know, 12 carries like we had mentioned, but I think a lot of that was due to Daryl Henderson playing in his first game in almost a year. I think the conditioning is going to get there, and we're going to see Royce Freeman relegated to more of a special teams role over the next few weeks. So I think Freeman at this point is going to need, you know, already got the injury to Kyron Williams, already got the injury to Ronnie Rivers. At this point, I think he'd need an injury to uh, Daryl Henderson to really get ahead of him. And Evans, like I said, just really isn't the guy at this point. So Royce Freeman, Zach Evans, I think you can confidently cut both of them. All right, Joey, one more guy. Bring us home. Who is the final guy we should be cutting from our rosters? Yeah, you're being a little generous to Keontae Ingram earlier in the show when you said him and it was a Damian Williams combined for one carry. (laughs) It was just Damian Williams (laughs) that did that. Uh, Keontae Ingram, uh, last week, he had seven points. Uh, Great. Thank you for those seven fantasy points. Probably didn't sink your team, but this week he was nowhere to be found. Di Mercado appears to be the running back to roster during this hurry back James Conner period of the season. Uh, uh, What's well, a Conner could be back as early as week 10, uh, which would be against the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, Ingram, I don't see a reason to keep him at this point in the season. Yep. Well, there you have it. We talked, uh, I wasn't keeping track. Some sort of number. We talked about some cuts. We talked about some ads, but uh, Alfredo's much better at pacing on the show and keeping up with these sorts of things. I'm just here to talk football, but we did it. We talked about guys you should add and guys you should cut. We'll be back tomorrow with Daniel Harms. Alfredo will be back here as we're going to talk about our rookie tiers and rankings for the rest of the season. We're going to be taking Wednesday off as Alfredo and I will both be on assignment. Then we'll be back Thursday with our starts of the week. And then, of course, on the audio version only, you can hear our news, notes, injury updates, all that sort of stuff. So we'll see you tomorrow to talk about some rookies. Thank you so much for tuning in. 